Well, uh, and thanks to the organizers for, for inviting me and putting this meeting on. Uh, I'm excited to tell you about some recent work I've been doing on quantum algorithms with uh, Shankar Balasubramanian, my grad student, and Tong Ying Li is an assistant professor at Peking University, was a postdoc with us uh, when, we, when we started the project. So this project is about trying to find uh, quantum speedups and quantum speedups over structures that, that have some kind of explanation. So in the, in the NISC era, right, we're trying to optimize many things. Uh, their heuristics are, are rising in importance as we have new devices that we just want to try out. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's a need to understand reasons why we might expect a quantum speedup. For example, with adiabatic evolution, there was a, a belief, I think people believe somewhat less now, that, that tunneling might explain some of the speedups. Uh, with quantum walks, it's a, a promising heuristic, but you know, what makes a quantum walk work well or not? Um, and today I'll tell you about a, a family of, of instances that is fairly broad that, uh, where we can expect large, uh, large speedups from them. So to talk about quantum walks, let me just set the stage by, by, mentioning, by contrasting with classical random walks uh, and also defining some of the notation. So uh, here's an example of a graph. This is the, the hypercube. It has an adjacency matrix, which has a, a one marking wherever the edges are, and a zero where there's no edge. And uh, the adjacency matrix we'll sometimes work with, but to define the walk, it's sometimes more natural to talk about the graph Laplacian. Uh, and that is just, you put along the diagonal the degree of each vertex, and if it's a regular graph, that's just a multiple of the identity matrix, and we'll just work with regular graphs today. Uh, and then you subtract the adjacency matrix. Um, and what's the point of this? One nice feature of the Laplacian is that if you want to talk about a continuous time random walk, then that is the right differential equation to use. So what is a continuous time random walk? Well, I have a probability distribution over all the vertices. And then as time evolves, according to a Poisson process, I jump to an adjacent vertex, right? So I sit for a while and then randomly I, I jump to an adjacent one. So from each point, probability is flowing out to the adjacent vertices. Uh, and so each point is losing probability at a rate proportional to its degree and gaining probability proportional to, you know, of course, from, from all of its neighbors, uh, giving rise to this, um, to this differential equation. <clears throat> and this will converge to, if it's a connected graph, to the, the uniform distribution. Um, one way to see that is that the Laplacian has all non-negative eigenvalues and it has a unique zero eigenvector, which is, uh, which is just the uniform distribution. So the uniform distribution will be preserved by this differential equation, and everything else is going to exponentially decay. Um, and another way to think about the Laplacian is if you think of it as a quadratic form, it, it's a way of measuring differences. So as a quadratic form, what I mean is uh, take a vector v and look at v transpose lv. Then this is, uh, you know, using Laplacian as a quadratic form, and what it is is the sum of the squares of the differences of v along every edge. So if v is the same everywhere, this will be zero. If v differs a lot along edges, then this is going to be big. And so this gives you an intuitive way of thinking about the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. The zero eigenvector is the vector that's the same everywhere. A low-lying eigenvector very slowly over the graph, and the high eigenvector varies very quickly. And so this tells you that the high eigenvectors decay quickly. Those are, are the fine details that are quickly washed out by the walk, whereas the slowly varying ones are the modes that last for a long time. Okay, so that is the classical picture. Um, almost can do the quantum one. One more classical thing I want to talk about is the continuous. So before we had continuous time, and now I want to also mention continuous space. Uh, and then continuous space version is the diffusion equation or the heat equation, uh, where the, this probability distribution now is a function of position, r, and it evolves according to a similar differential equation, except now the Laplacian is, is the Laplacian from calculus. But otherwise, it's basically the same story. Um, and the quantum version of this is the Schrodinger equation, and up to some units, uh, it's basically just putting an i in front of, this, uh, in front of the Laplacian. So you can think of, you know, this is not maybe the usual way that people think about the Schrodinger equation, but uh, 
I think a very natural picture of it is it's really just the, uh, you know, it's very analogous to, to, to classical random walks, just with, uh, instead of things exponentially decaying, they oscillate. So the, the slowly varying modes oscillate in time slowly, the quickly varying modes oscillate in time quickly. You're just replacing exponential decay with, with oscillations. Okay. Um, and so I think from this perspective, as a, as a quantum algorithm designer, it's very natural to think about what are classical random walks achieving and what about their, uh, you know, to interpret the quantum Schrodinger equation as, a, uh, as an analog of that. And so one way to, to think about this is one thing we often want to do with classical walks is mix rapidly, right? We want to converge to the stationary distribution, and we want these, uh, the higher eigenvectors of the Laplacian to die out. Uh, so here's like a, a simple example of what the, these eigenmodes look like. If you have a very simple graph like the line, um, then the, uh, here's some of the first few eigenvectors. The blue line is, is the, the lowest one. Uh, the green line is the next one, the, or, the red line is the eigenvector after that, and so on. Uh, and you see each successive eigenvector oscillates a little bit faster. Um, and the eigenvalues, let's call it the lowest one is zero. The first one, the lambda one, uh, is, we can also call it G because it's the gap between the stationary state and the, and the next eigenvector. And that eigenvalue gap governs the mixing time of the, rand of the classical random walk, right? Because that's the slowest decaying mode. So if you want everything except for the uniform distribution to decay, the amount of time you have to wait is on the order of 1 over g. Uh, so that's how classical walks mix, and that's what governs their speed. The quantum analog of this, uh, of course, nothing is decaying. Everything is now unitary. Things are picking up phase at different rates. So the zero eigenvector is, is again stationary. That one's not changing at all. All the other eigenvectors are just oscillating at different rates. And one thing that you might want to do is, for example, the thing you do in Grover's algorithm, uh, where you reflect about a particular vector. So now if you want to reflect about the stationary vector, you'd like that one to have a phase of minus one and everything else to have a phase of one. Right? You want them to have kind of opposite phases. And so the hardest phases to distinguish are still the, uh, the stationary state and the, the eigenvector right above that. And so if the eigenvalue gap is g, then it'll take time 1 over g for these to become out of phase by, um, you know, by a factor of pi, right? Uh, and there are some tricks you can do, started by uh, Zegedy um, and, and further developed by Magniev, Nayak, Roland, Santa, um, and, and several other papers that can improve this, this quantum reflection time to 1 over squared of g. You kind of modify the walk in certain ways, which, which I don't want to get into, uh, but there's a, a long line of work that does this, and this has given rise to quadratic speedups for many of the things that you do, use a classical walk for. So, for example, you might use a classical random walk to converge to the stationary distribution, maybe not just of one markup chain, but of a sequence of them, as in simulated annealing. And that under fairly general conditions can be quadratically sped up by a quantum computer. Or maybe you want to not just mix over a space, but search for certain marked elements. And, and again, under pretty general conditions, that can be quadratically sped up. So many of these, uh, these types of, of classical algorithms can get quadratic speed ups um, basically by uh, using as a subroutine a quantum walk that reflects about the stationary distribution. Um, and one, you know, people often think of these as sort of Grover-like, which they are. They, there's one, I think, underappreciated advantage over Grover, um, which is that Grover is a quadratic speedup of brute force search, which is rarely the best algorithm to use in a situation. But classical random walks, especially simulated annealing, are, if not the best classical algorithm for many problems, a very competitive one. They're often a, a pretty plausible approach to, to many classical algorithms, to many, to many problems. And so quadratically speeding them up is at least a quadratic speed up of what's often the best algorithm for a problem. Of course, it's still probably not enough to justify all of the other expense and overhead of building a quantum computer, uh, but it's, uh, I think, more likely to be competitive than, than Grover's algorithm. Okay, so I want to talk about how we can go beyond a quadratic speedup. 
And one intriguing example of this was given, um, I'm, actually, I forgot to put in the citation, and I, I know <coughs> Julia Kempe was involved in this, and um, yeah, several other people were too. This was from. Probably, yes. Yeah, this is like, uh, yeah, this was around 2000 or, or so, um, where they observed that quantum walks could traverse uh, some graphs with much more than a quadratic speed up. Uh, one example is the hypercube. So uh, the hypercube of, of dimension n has two to the n vertices. Suppose your problem is you want to start in the all zero vertex and end up in the all one vertex. Uh, then classically, if you do a random walk, this will take you time on the order of two to the n. Basically, you're just going to bounce around at random. You'll very rapidly mix, right? A random walk on the hypercube will quickly converge to the uniform distribution. But if you're bouncing around according to the uniform distribution, you just have a small chance of actually hitting this, uh, this all one vector. Uh, however, a quantum walk can traverse it very quickly in time polynomial in n. Uh, and the reason is we can group the graph according to Hamming weight. So here is Hamming weight zero, Hamming weight one. I don't need, actually, you kind of don't need this pointer, right? Just where those little green ovals are, I've, I've grouped it according to Hamming weight. And then the graph becomes equivalent to one where we group together one vertex of Hamming weight zero, three vertices of Hamming weight one, three vertices of Hamming weight two, and, and one of Hamming weight one. Uh, and then here, these 363, three, I've marked how many edges there are between these different groups. So this graph, from the perspective of a quantum walk, is equivalent to a 1D graph. Because if you start with, let's say, you start on the, zero, on the all zero string, when you do the quantum walk, you'll couple to a superposition over everything of Hamming weight one. And then if you apply the Hamiltonian to that, then that you'll go, some of your amplitude will go to Hamming weight zero, some will go to a superposition of everything of Hamming weight two. And so you have this low dimensional subspace spanned by vectors that are superpositions of all the strings of a given Hamming weight. So instead of having a subspace of dimension two to the n, you have a subspace of dimension n plus one, right? The dimensions just, the vectors just correspond to the different Hamming weights. And so you have an effective evolution on this much smaller graph. Um, now the graph has some kind of uneven coupling, so there's maybe something non-trivial to analyze, but right away, this looks very promising, right? It's kind of like when you do the analysis of Grover's algorithm and you go down to a two-dimensional subspace, uh, that's gonna simplify your analysis and, and potentially lead to speedups. And of course, Grover's algorithm still takes a long time relative to those two dimensions, but just, being in a lower dimensional subspace already is, uh, is, is promising. So this is an advantage of quantum walks over classical walks, but not over all classical algorithms. So uh, first of all, the challenge of going from the all zero string to the all one string is, is a trivial, you know, that's not even a, really a, a computational problem. Then you might say, well, let me, let me disguise the labels of the, ver of the vertices, right? So suppose I just have an oracle that uh, replaces each vertex label with some uh, per, you know, disguised version of it and just spits out the identities of the neighboring vertices. And this is not totally crazy. This is sort of if I'm doing some kind of search over some optimization landscape and there's not much I really know about the structure other than the, the value of the function, uh, then maybe there's no, I don't know how to take advantage of structure and, and this is effectively what I have in many cases. However, the hypercube is a simple enough graph that if you have an oracle of this nature, you can figure out where in the hypercube you are. Because wherever you are, you can figure, you can, you can make, many, there are many small cycles which can basically help you orient yourself and you can recover co a coordinate structure uh, just from this information. Um, I don't quite want to get into it, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a nice exercise to, to figure this out if, if you want to think about that. Okay, so this is not a, a quantum speed up in the, you know, precisely, but it, is, it does seem promising. And based on this promise, uh, this uh, group of authors 20 years ago found a very intriguing exponential speed up, which on the one hand, it looks like a platypus. It looks, you know, there's nothing else in the, well, 
the, the platypus thing is really good and bad, right? So it looks nothing like the hidden subgroup problem, making use of group symmetry, algebraic structure. Uh, so that is, that is great, right? That's what we want is diverse quantum speedups. On the other hand, it's been hard to generalize. The structure seems quite rigid. Changing features of it seems to break many of its features um, uh, that, that, that are responsible for success. Um, so that has, it, you know, since then it has, it has rarely, there's, there hasn't been much, people have not really been able to, to generalize it. So what is the speed up? Uh, you, it's called the welded trees, and you have two binary trees of depth n, uh, one on the left, one on the right, and then you take their leaves and you weld them together by basically doing a random cycle between, that bounces from one side to the other side, uh, just like in this picture. Okay, so um, what will happen if you do a quantum walk here? Again, you have these, uh, you have the, you have, you basically live in a lower dimensional subspace. So what happens is if you look at each column, if you have a super a uniform superposition over that column, that will couple to uniform superpositions of the column to the left and to the right. Uh, and so even though the number of vertices is exponential in n, you effectively live in a graph of dimension only 2n. And here I've labeled the effective graph, the, the numbers inside the circles are the number of vertices inside each, uh, I'm going to call them super vertices. So you have the, you know, the original vertices and then the super vertices are, are like collections of them. And then the labels on the edges are the number of edges connecting each super vertex. Uh, and I put the middle one dashed to show that that one's a little bit different, right? That one, you know, kind of all the edges look similar except for that one uh, that, that corresponds to the welt. And so, it turns out, if you convert this to a Hamiltonian on this 1D graph, this looks like a Hamiltonian where you have couplings of strength root 2 everywhere except a coupling of, of strength 1 in the middle. Uh, and so this original paper said, well, this is basically like a particle on a line, right? Except for that point in the middle, it's a particle on a line, and we know how those propagate. And then, okay, there's some defect or something in the middle. Maybe you'll get some reflection, but you'll also get some transmission. You'll have a decent chance of something making it through to the other side. Uh, so they were able to show that a quantum algorithm can get from one end to the other in time polynomial in n, uh, whereas classical algorithms take time exponential in n. Okay, so why is that? Well, certainly a classical random walk is going to get stuck in the middle uh, because at any point in the graph, you know, wherever you are, there are two edges that go inward towards the middle and one edge that goes back out. So if you're walking randomly, you're probably going to take edges that lead you in more often than out. Like you'll go out a little bit, but most of the time you'll be very close to the middle. That's where most of the vertices are, right? So the uniform distribution spends most of its time near the middle. However, we want to beat all classical algorithms, not just random walks. And the clever thing about this graph is that if, you've done, if you haven't explored very much of it, it will always, the, the little subgraph that you've explored will always look like a tree. <clears throat> so certainly on the, when you're just on the left side, it will look completely like a tree. But even once you've made it to the middle and you've gone through the weld, at that point, there's so many vertices in the middle that you're unlikely to ever encounter a vertex you've already seen before. So you might explore for a while, come back, take a different branch, explore that way, come back, try some different branches. Each one of these branches will always find fresh vertices, at least um, you know, with, with probability exponentially close to one. You might get lucky, right? You might get lucky and find a short cycle, uh, but, but with high probability, you won't. And so what that means is from the perspective of a classical algorithm, there's no structure. Right? If you find a cycle, you've learned a little bit about the structure of the graph. In the hypercube, the cycles were abundant. But here, you'll never find a cycle, and so you'll never learn anything. And so it'll just look like a tree. And all you can do, basically, you can't do anything better than a random walk. You can just, you know, as you explore deeper and deeper, that's, that essentially amounts to, I mean, more precisely, a non-backtracking random walk. Right? You can at least avoid going back the direction you came in, but, but that doesn't help very much. Okay, so it's a beautiful speed up, I think, but it's, uh, you know, 
obviously, there are no problems in nature that, or in, uh, in industry that, that look like this. Uh, so, you know, so what can we do with this exactly? Um, maybe I should pause. Any questions so far? Yeah. Um, do you have an intuition for what suppresses the binomial coefficients on the edges in the quantum look? Um, say, what do you mean binomial coefficients? I mean, I mean the, you know, the, like in the classical walk, you know, you have this binomial behavior that concentrates you in the middle. Right? Mm -hmm. So something suppresses that in the quantum look. Good. Yeah, so why? Um, yeah. Um, Yeah, I mean, I guess Scott is getting at the fact that my explanation of being in an n plus one dimensional subspace is a little bit incomplete because the random walk also lives in an n plus one dimensional subspace, right? If I have the uniform distribution over one column and I take one step of the random walk, that'll couple me to the uniform distribution to the right and the, of, of the column to the right and the uniform distribution of the column to the left. And this is a biased random walk, right? It prefers to move to the center than to move uh, away from the center. And so, you know, we know how to analyze a 1D biased random walk that like always prefers to return to zero. It's going to have some little fluctuations, but the chance that it ever reaches plus or minus n is going to be exponentially small in n. So what's different in the quantum case, it's not just the lower dimension, as, uh, as you're pointing out. Um, one way that you might think about it, and, and people have also tried to think about advantages of the adi adiabatic evolution, ground state adiabatic evolution for stochastic Hamiltonians in similar terms, is that probability distributions follow the, the L1 norm and uh, quantum amplitudes follow the L2 norm. And so when you have constructive interference, uh, that can, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so how does this, Basically, what happens is when you move from a big column to a smaller column, the, classically, the probabilities would just add, but quantumly, the amplitudes would add. And that enhances the probability of, of moving there. So if you, um, right, so if I, if I add up two, if I have two amplitudes that are both alpha, and I add them together, I get two alpha, then the corresponding probability is actually multiplied by four. Whereas, so that enhances the probability of moving from a, of a big column to a small column, and it suppresses the column of moving from a big column to an even bigger column. So uh, that's some intuition, and, and that's, I think, also related to this L1 versus L2 business of, of adiabatic evolution, where sometimes when you compare adiabatic evolution versus simulated annealing, whether you have a, you know, they don't behave identically when you, when you vary the size of the space that you're, you're spreading out your uniform distribution over. Um, yeah, that part is a little bit, yeah, that intuition is a little bit vague, and it's, it's also not the same intuition I'll give later in the talk. But so, uh, yeah, it's a good, yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and yeah, it's worth continuing to chew on, I think. Any other questions? Maybe just if we continue, because for remote people, they'll need to use yeah, the yeah. microphone. So Good. Easier, yeah. Okay, so everything was, uh, okay, so, so far I haven't said anything new, right? This is all past work. Let me, so now, what we tried to do is try to generalize the, uh, this welded tree. And, and what we did is we considered something we called hierarchical graphs. Basically graphs that can be grouped together into super vertices. So here there's, you know, I drew it with sort of an obvious grouping, and then it corresponds to a graph like this. And unlike the welded trees, I don't require a tree structure. I don't require that every vertex be, uh, you know, connected in some kind of uniform way to the others. It's enough even just to have random connectivity between the super vertices. All I need is that uniform superpositions get mapped to uniform superpositions. Uh, and so in this example, I've, I've labeled it with the, with the number of vertices. And so that in general what we're going to do. We're going to say we have a big graph that has this kind of structure, uh, and then it should be equivalent to a much smaller graph where I just labeled the, vertice the super vertices with a number of, of little vertices in them. Uh, and then, based on their ratios, you can calculate these uh, effective hopping terms. And so you get an effective Hamiltonian uh, 
with some, some hopping terms that look like this. So in order to make this, to, sh to show you how to concretely analyze this, I'm going to carry out the analysis for the case of a 1D supergraph. Uh, and then I'll just state the results that we have for, for uh, higher dimensional ones. So here's an example of a, of a 1D supergraph. Uh, you have the, the supergraph is this line of right here of, with sizes S0, S1, and so on. And the number of edges I've marked as uh, E01, I, I didn't write it out, but E12, E23, et cetera. And you can see, unlike the welded tree, the size doesn't have to always go up. Uh, it doesn't always have to be powers of two. It just made it a lot easier to draw that way. Um, and you can have short cycles all over the place, right? So the welded, the tree by construction had no cycles. Here I'm imagining randomly wiring one super vertex to the next one. Uh, doesn't have to be random, it just has to be kind of regular enough. Uh, and so short cycles are, are, are very much allowed. Um, and then you, so what happens is you map it to this super graph and then you get a, uh, you know, an effective Hamiltonian with these hopping terms. And the, the way of calculating the hopping term is just the number of edges between two super vertices divided by uh, the geometric mean of their sizes. Um, so what we, if you have something where it's steadily growing, like in the welded tree, all the hopping terms will be the same, um, or steadily shrinking, all the hopping terms will be the same. Of course, it can't be the same everywhere, you know, but uh, it can be the same in, in most places. Um, and what we considered is we said, well, you know, that's a little bit rigid. What if you just choose these things at random? So what if the size, the ratio of sizes is some random number? Let's say it's order one, so you're not growing dramatically from one uh, layer to the next one, uh, what does that look like? So you have this effective Hamiltonian in 1D. You have uh, the superpositions over, you know, we, we live in this, in this lower dimensional subspace spanned by the superpositions over super vertices, which I've labeled by ket0, ket1, ket2, and so on. Uh, and then you have these hopping terms, which, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the formula for before. So we get the Hamiltonian which is basically just the adjacency matrix. Okay, I know I said at the beginning we'd use the Laplacian, but that just adds a factor of the identity, so I'll just ignore that. Uh, and what, is the, what does the Hamiltonian look like? It's got zero along the diagonal, and then these hopping terms uh, along the off diagonals. T0, T1, T2, et cetera, are the hopping terms. So um, these are called, apparently, according to Wikipedia, hollow matrices, ones that have zeros along the diagonal. Um, and they're also symmetric. So if you have these properties, turns out that the spectrum is symmetric about zero. So if eigenvalue lambda shows up, so does minus lambda. And if there are an odd number of vertices, as in this case, we can also handle the even one, but this makes things a little simpler. Um, if there are an odd number of vertices, then there'll be, you know, everything, all the eigenvalues have to have a, a negative partner. And so that means there should be a zero eigenvalue. Um, and in many cases, this zero mode is special. So the zero eigenvalue is the one, you know, satisfying h times ket size zero. I want to emphasize, this is not like the zero of the Laplacian that sits at the bottom of the spectrum. This sits in the middle because everything else, you know, goes positive or negative. And I've drawn the spectrum a little bit exaggerated uh, so I can fit in the letters gap. But, you know, often there's a substantial gap between the zero and, and the rest of the spectrum. Uh, you can calculate the gap as we do in our paper. You can take a, a minor by deleting one row and column and, uh, and inverting it. But uh, suffice to say that, that often the gap is not negligible. And the zero mode, apart from being separated from the rest by a decent gap, also often has decent overlap with the entrance and the exit, the zero state and the six state. OK, so I'm saying often and sometimes. Uh, so what's, what's that about? This is um, one of the main contributions of our paper is just noticing that in the condensed matter literature, these questions have been studied under the topic of uh, de many body of localization versus uh, delocalization. So in some cases, you have localization, which means that all of the eigenstates uh, you know, are localized around one point and exponentially decay as you get farther away. Uh, in other cases, you um, you know, they're delocalized, they're spread out over the whole system. Do I have five minutes? Yeah. So, um, 
probably went a little bit too slowly. Um, so I'll just briefly say, when, if you can, you can do the calculation, calculate what the zero mode is, and then we can see a little bit more of this localization versus delocalization. Um, there's just a very simple recurrence for the values of the zero mode. It turns out it only is supported on every other vertex. Uh, and when you calculate the amplitude of this at, point two, at the 2k point, it's just it's related to the amplitude at, at zero times just a product of these hopping terms or of ratios of these hopping terms. And if you think of these hopping terms as random, because we want to have a you know, fairly, we want to make as few assumptions as we can about the structure, uh, then these amplitudes will do basically like a random walk or a multiplicative random walk. And so the amplitude at the left edge will be related to the amplitude at the right edge by a factor of e to the plus or minus order root n. Uh, and in the condensed matter literature, this would actually be referred to as localized because it's exponentially decaying. But from an algorithm point of view, it's, it's actually quite good. This actually is a 2 to the root n time algorithm compared to 2 to the n time classically. Uh, and I haven't explained how to calculate the gap, but a similar argument will show that the gap also goes like e to the, to the minus order root n under, under general conditions. So this gives rise to a simple algorithm. You start in the zero state. You evolve your Hamiltonian for amount of time that's random, somewhere between zero and one over the gap. Uh, this will basically amount to measuring in the energy eigenbasis with a precision of g. And that's enough to resolve this zero mode. So it'll basically collapse you onto the zero mode. And then if you measure back in the position basis, you have a decent chance of hitting the exit node. And all of these things, they're sort of 2 to the root n factors. And this gives rise to a 2 to the root n quantum algorithm versus a 2 to the n time classical one. So if you have super vertex sizes where the ratios between them are, are order 1, and let's say they're, they're random values, uh, then the quantum runtime will be e to the order root n. Um, and the classical runtime will be e to the order n. The classical runtime will just depend on the biggest super vertex, because that's where you'll get lost. And that one will depend on the product of all of these r's, all of these ratios. So you can think of that as the expectation of log r, whereas the quantum runtime will depend on the variance of log r. So as you kind of tune your distribution, these can vary in different ways. And the welded trees, the r's are basically almost all the same. And then you get a polynomial time algorithm. But if you generalize it a little bit, you can do pretty much anything to them, and you'll still get something that's sub-exponential. So the speed up is not as good, but it's way, way more general, and, it, and it's still much better than polynomial. If you move to more general graphs, let's say your super graph is not a 1D line, but a, a D-dimensional lattice, um, it turns out that if D is 2, you get a quasi-polynomial speed up, and if D is more than 2, uh, sorry, quasi-polynomial runtime, and if D is more than 2, you just get a polynomial runtime, and classically, it's always exponential. Um, there's some conditions here, but I, I, I don't want to get into this because I want to move, to move on. Just to briefly explain sort of the, the summary, classical algorithms have to explore most of the graph. Uh, so whatever the graph size is, that will tell you the runtime. Quantum algorithms, the speed depends on the localization transition, but it's always going to be better, right? So if it's delocalized, then that's polynomial time. If it's, if it's localized, in this 1D way, it'll still be a uh, super polynomial speed up. Uh, okay, it's not all rosy. So if you have a general solution landscape, like you know, here's a, an optimization landscape, um, you might have edges within a super vertex. And those in the condensed matter literature, those are called diagonal disorder, because now you have entries along the diagonal of that matrix, which can fluctuate. And those can localize you more strongly, depending on how big they are. You can also have irregular connections, which means you only approximately stay within this low dimensional subspace. And that can, of course, cause the whole thing to break down if the super vertices are, are not actually a good description of the graph. Then there are two applications, which I think I will not have time to discuss. Um, one of them is trying to find an actual function, not an oracle that instantiates this. One such function comes from simulated annealing if the state space were to be disguised. Uh, say via something like homomorphic encryption. So that would give you an actual function you can compute efficiently. You wouldn't need an oracle for this. Uh, although we're still searching for one where that would be totally natural. 
Um, and then we believe that our techniques also can be used to give an alternate proof of this uh, exponential speed up for ground state stochastic adiabatic evolution. So this is a, a big breakthrough by Hastings and, and Gillian Vazirani recently. Uh, and we believe this would just give an alternate construction uh, uh, that would lead to the results. Um, but those are things, um, yeah, hopefully in a future talk I'll be able to tell you about. Okay, thanks for your attention.